Hello, this is Nathan Crutchfield, and I'd like to talk with you briefly about the use of the hierarchy of controls. You've gone through your workplace, and you've identified the existing and potential hazards, determined the consequences of exposure, identified at-risk events, and you've determined both the probability and severity based on the risk assessment matrix. You're beginning to establish the priorities of the various jobs and tasks and how you might go about best controlling the hazards and the risk. This is where the hierarchy of controls comes into play. This is the hierarchy of controls. The most effective at the top is eliminate or avoid the risk or the hazard completely. In other words, there's no exposure. By not doing something and you're not close to the hazard, there can be no loss potential. The second is to substitute for less hazardous materials, processes, operations, or equipment. We see this primarily in uh, the use of chemicals, where we substitute a maybe a VOC with a water-based compound or something that has less uh, potential for injury. We may reduce the speeds, forces, amperage, pressures, temperatures, noise levels. We substitute. The third level is engineering controls, where we work to engineer the hazards out. Uh, this could include ventilation systems, machine guarding, sound enclosures, circuit breakers, platforms and guardrails, interlocks, lift tables. We're building into the design of the job something that keeps the person or an object away from the hazard. Next, we will set up warning devices. There may be alarms, beepers, horns, labels, signage, decals, various things that will warn people that a hazard is present. We move on to number five, where we have administrative control procedures. These are the SOPs, standard operating procedures or safe job procedures. We might rotate workers, uh, implement equipment inspections, change work schedules, do training, hazard communications training, confined space entry training, all those things that we would uh, we think of as being a part of the human element. These do not change the scope and nature of the hazard, but they are training people and effectively putting into place administrative controls to let people know that hazards are present. Last but not least is the last resort is personal protective equipment. We've done all we can with regards to engineering, substitution, avoiding. Uh, we, put in, we put materials such as safety glasses, hearing protection, face shields, safety harnesses, lanyards. We at least harden the target, so to speak. We put equipment on the individual to prevent the hazard from breaching through and causing harm to the body. The hierarchy of controls can do the following. It's a systematic approach to eliminate, reduce, or control the, the risk of different hazards. There are steps in the hierarchy, as we just went through, that are in order of effectiveness. These steps can be combined to achieve an acceptable risk. You would definitely, if you're putting PPE on, have administrative controls. You would have warnings to let people know when they have to wear the PPE. Uh, if you've got engineering devices in place, we have administration of how we maintain those and let people know what the hazard is within that uh, engineering device. So we can combine all of these into achieving an acceptable risk. Uh, as we do this, we do have to take into account the nature of the hazard, how severe is severe, the exposures that we might encounter, all of these many things we've got to take into account. There's a discussion within ANSI AIHA Z10 2005, look in Appendix G, and in Section 5.1.1. This is Nathan Crutchfield again. Uh, join us for additional information about job hazard analysis at myjobhazardanalysis.com. We've used materials developed from Job Hazard Analysis, a Guide for Voluntary Compliance and Beyond written by James Routon and Nathan Crutchfield, published by Butterworth Heinemann in 2008. Thanks for listening and look forward to talking to you again.